So uh, I will cover this specific project that looks at the relation between basically economic growth on one side and uh, environmental crisis on the other side. And our research question was very simple. It was basically what are the connections between those two things and how they are related and uh, can we learn more and gain understanding our, of our current condition by looking into that direction. And we simply went to, to meet uh, researchers and so on about that. But before starting, I just want to mention that you know the, these projects are not uh, things we do um, just by one or two person, but it's a collective effort. And uh, those are projects that have been developed uh, not only with uh, Maria Oshkowska and I, but also with uh, Baruch Gottlieb, Jérôme Sinclair, and many other collaborators. And it's really like sort of this dynamic that uh, translates in the project and that we try to, to keep as a sort of signature of what we're doing. Um, basically, we, we figured out that it's very hard to think beyond growth. Like basically, if you think about it, even the, the, the values we use every day to make decisions, to, uh, to, to make sense of the world, are inherited uh, mostly by an era of growth. So the, the philosophy we read, the, the politics we, we use to think about society and so on, are mostly the result of uh, you know, like post-enlightenment. And they are by design inherited uh, or uh, translating uh, values that are al already very growth focused. So it's a bit hard to, to even think uh, outside of a logic of growth. So that's why we, we thought that um, we are interested in this investigation, but we won't do it just by ourselves and our own intuition, but we will just uh, organize so that we can meet people and collect uh, knowledge, uh, concepts, provocations that helps things about those questions otherwise. Basically, we will just share a few of the basic sort of inputs that uh, can help uh, look at those issues uh, from a different angle. And one that we like to, to share in this kind of introduction is um, this idea that, you know, transition is always for tomorrow or for yesterday or something. You know, it, it feels for, for the last 40 years that uh, we are in the transition or transition is coming. And if you look at the news, uh, you know, like TV, journals, specialized literature, it always feels like we are in the process of transitioning. Uh, but the, the, the interesting fact is when you look at the numbers, when you look at the, the energy that is sustaining our culture and our lifestyle in a way, uh, it's just growing. It's adding up, we could say. It's piling up. So basically, um, maybe the news is covering a new energy type. Let's say if you live in the uh, in UK, uh, in the England, uh, in the late uh, 1900, uh, 19th century, um, you, you will have the, the, the news already covering the fact that coal is uh, slowly uh, uh, diminishing and that uh, new energy will be ne needed. And if you are in Europe in the 60s, you will hear that uh, nuclear energy is coming and will replace the other source. And in the last 40 years, we hear that wind and solar is replacing slowly, but surely uh, all the other source. And actually, when you look at the number, we are rather adding up new energy sources all the time. And it's sort of an inflation of the quantity of energy that our lifestyle uh, rely or depends upon. And often the trick uh, is that uh, news is covering about household um, energy use. Uh, so, if you think just about household, uh, in France, we have a lot of nuclear energy. So, you know, electrical use inside your apartment is perhaps quite clean. But that's not how society works. I mean, everything around you um, is the product of very complex system and, and machineries and different infrastructures that makes those things available to you. So, the chairs that are here, you know, they they, they were produced in many different places and transported and so on. That's not just a question of electricity, that's a question of a lot of different steps where mostly fossil fuel energy is needed. Um, so that's just a way to remember that transition seems to be coming, but actually uh, maybe it's not coming so quick. And in the past we never really knew, we never experienced a deliberate energy transition. 
So it's quite bold to think that it will come. So then from that moment, uh, it sort of invites us to think differently about what a transition could mean, or if we need to change the world, and at least if we, we need to change strategy. Uh, and maybe the transition is not just a question of energy or not just a question of technology, but maybe it asks us or it requires us to think much more deeply about what type of changes are necessary. The second sort of, you know, pseudo-scientific sort of document uh, that also is quite provocative is this document that shows the relation between GDP, so what we commonly see as growth, and uh, energy sources, and most likely oil. And it can be a little bit weird to, to see those correlations at first. But actually, to get there, we have to think a little bit in another way. So basically, <clears throat> you could think, think that uh, the way you expand your body in space and use your body and uh, work with your body is the way that the world around you is transformed. But perhaps that's not the only way, and that's not the best way to think about your con contemporary condition, in the sense that the world around us is mostly transformed by all the indirect uh, infrastructure and machinery we activate with our lifestyle. So let's think about the way your apartment is heated. It's not heated with your own activity, actions, and movements. If you think about how your jackets are made, they are not made with most likely with uh, the, the activity of your own body. If you think about how these buildings uh, have been built, and so on and so on, and the streets and the hospital and the schools, I mean, everything that makes your uh, lifestyle as a Slovenian, as a European, as a what you name it, uh, is uh, not, mostly not, the product of your own body activity. And we can even say it in another way, it's mostly the product of uh, machine, uh, machinic activity or infrastructure activity. And this infrastructure uh, is, uh, I mean, you feed this infrastructure with energy, basically, and mostly with oil. So from the moment you see it through this lens, you can see society as a sort of um, mostly machinic system where just human activity is a little part, the direct human activity, and the indirect human activity through machinery is the most part. So from this moment, uh, there is a strong relation with from how much energy you input in the system and how much GDP it produces. And furthermore, we could even see that there is another step of correlation with environmental change because energy uh, inputted in the system is also a change produced in the, um, in the system and a change produced uh, in uh, the environment, let's say. It's sort of basic physics, you know, like uh, if there is movement, if there is heat and so on, it's a uh, change in the system, in the environment where this uh, energy has been up, uh, deployed. So that's an interesting take also on the issues we will talk about. And the last one we often introduce is this uh, very uh, simple correlation between the average income uh, in the last uh, 50 years and uh, the level of you know, happiness or satisfaction or whatever, or at, at least the feeling of being satisfied by life. And we can see that uh, above a certain th threshold, uh, above a certain line, there is no correlation anymore. And that can also help us to think about uh, different uh, trajectories uh, that are available. So, well, we, we basically um, started um, investigating this uh, field, large field of questioning, and uh, um, simply by um, going to universities and meeting with researchers, theoreticians, activists, and simply we asked them more or less the same question, and started to, uh, we started to, to compile uh, notions and key concepts that we think are helpful to uh, take those issues from other perspectives and to nuance uh, our ability to make sense of uh, the changes we are going through and what we sometimes name as a crisis, even if the crisis will be very long, so maybe it's not anymore a crisis, it's something else. But still, we need to make sense of it to feel 
that we at least understand parts of the challenges and maybe that we can act upon those challenges. So we'll just share a couple of the um, uh, interviews and notions that uh, we collected. Uh, just as an um, example of the methodology and the type of contents. Uh, and we invite you to, to look at the other notions uh, online. So we share a first notion um, that uh, came out of the interview and discussions with uh, Valerie Olson, uh, which is a California-based uh, anthropologist, and she's just exchanging with us about uh, growth. In the techno-scientific elite communities, growth is understood to be the equivalent of life, and to not grow is the equivalent of death or to die. And I think it's an interesting thing to contemplate post-growth, a post-growth project or a post-growth ideology or post-growth collaborations and the things that you're interested in with an eye to figuring out what the metaphorical and even cosmological implications of post-growth mean in relation to biological principles and understandings of life. Because I think that even among the aerospace uh, neoliberal utopians, thinking of Elon Musk as someone who's, who's imagining life on Mars and developing technologies to move human societies to other planets, the idea implicit in this is the idea of infinite growth. The idea that there can't be a cessation from inf infinite growth, which has religious origins in the West, um, and all, but also technical and scientific origins in the ideas that growth is good. I think attending to that, attending to anxieties around choosing something other than growth, attending to the cosmological, metaphorical, discursive anxieties that this produces in societies enculturated to fetishize growth is going to be a really important part of, of the work that needs to be done at this point on transitioning to post-growth. As it's understood biologically, there's a, a sort of naturalization or an objectification of the idea of growth as being uh, the central and core principle of understanding life. And biology has a lot of other contributing factors to thinking about death and transformation and the, the rapidity or slowness of growth. Growth is not a monolithic idea. There's very, very slow growth. There's, there's actually uh, other kind, there's, there's non-growth, right? There's, there's other than decay, there might be contraction. There might be um, a conservation of energy in an organism that is able to suspend itself and go to sleep when it's run out of resources. There's a lot of ways of looking at growth not as a kind of normative rule or principle that biology legitimates or authorizes as being the right, the right way to be. It's an, it's, I think it's ontologically, I think it's, there's an ontological imperative to thinking about growth as the optimal condition of the organism, when there are many, many ways to look at uh, life and death not as opposites or as distinct things apart from one another in biology and ecology, but to look at life and death on a continuum and to look at growth as being one modality within that continuum that would allow us to think differently about what it means to be alive, adopting a, a position outside of the de facto authoritative position of growth is good, non-growth is bad. Okay, and just to show you a little bit the spectrum of uh, the fields and the notions and the types of content we collected, uh, we just share another uh, concept, an interview, uh, coming more from the um, side of the digital culture and informatics, that looks at what could be the... Um, desirable path for informatics and computing uh, in if we confront uh, the idea that there will be contraction and the, there will be uh, declining resources uh, available uh, and that 
there might be uh, times where computing will be less easily available or less cheap and so on. And that field uh, is called uh, collapse informatics. Over the last number of years, and, uh, several of my colleagues and I have been working on a couple of different topics that interrelate. One is collapse informatics and another is computing within limits. Both of them focus on the idea that industrial civilization as we currently know it um, is potentially creating the conditions for, for its own failure or making, um, making the viability of its own ecosystems and its own um, ways of, of existing, calling them into question. And so um, both collapse informatics and computing within limits are exploring aspects of that um, problem of sort of ways that we can use um, ways that we can use novel forms of computing and ways that um, these set of ideas affect the computing industry and the research community to be able to bring about new kinds of computing systems that might allow us as a civilization to, to more effectively engage with these, um, these sets of issues. So, um, for example, Collapse Informatics was focusing on building systems in the abundant present for, for use in a future of scarcity. And Computing Within Limits has been looking at the notion that industrial civilization is typically very much growth focused and the computing industry situated within industrial civilization is also tends to be growth focused. Um, however, there might be new kinds of computing that could arise that could support a degrowth or an anti-growth um, type of direction for civilization um, with the broad sense being that that will either be something that we go into voluntarily by transforming civilization um, into something that is not so growth focused or something that will be thrust on us involuntarily as civilization potentially uh, begins to collapse around us over the next couple of decades. Okay, so we collected like uh, a whole set of uh, notions. We started to just compile them uh, on this uh, platform as a sort of, uh, you know, like early stage research. Um, also for us to just uh, have a common base uh, of to think about those issues, uh, a variety of angles to embrace those issues and the complexity of those issues. So that's how sort of the, the larger research project started. And from that point, we were concerned with the fact of, you know, how do you circulate those contents? How do you uh, make them available? How do you make them uh, used by uh, media, by, uh, you know, not only scientific, but uh, a larger part of society and so on. So we started, you know, different uh, tests um, and different methods to sort of support and facilitate the circulation of these contents. Uh, and one very obvious one, was just to make a visual proxy to those ideas. Because most of these ideas, we collected them from the academic field, where mostly they exist as text, you know, like academic papers. And there is hardly no image around this, hardly no, you know, like interpretation of it. So we started just this, this simple task of producing sort of a visual proxy so that those ideas can uh, maybe uh, circulate easier in society. And uh, from there, we also started to, um, you know, ask ourselves about how to facilitate uh, not only the fact that those notions exist and circulate, but that they are embraced uh, and also uh, challenged uh, and put into um, friction one with the other and so on. And that's where we started to think about ways to facilitate uh, discussion around those notions and uh, using game uh, methodologies and game design. So we worked with um, a colleague of us, uh, Julian Modé, and we started to, you know, to just to test different uh, strategies to basically, you know, create situations and use game design as a trick to sit people together and uh, have them spend quality time, like maybe an hour or 30 minutes, um, engaging with this kind of issues and sort of appropriating those ideas. Uh, and that's what we did this afternoon at the university. Uh, and yeah, we experimented those uh, different um, tools and strategies with, and tactics uh, with a set of uh, students and participants. Um, so that's for like, the, let's say the, the one year and a half or two years at the beginning of this research, where we, we created this kind of set of methods, strategies and notions. And then we started developing actual like physical projects, basically by identifying some notions that we believe are 
uh, very strong, very provocative, uh, and that we, you know, wanted just to create uh, physical situations that uh, help us engage with those notions and also, you know, experience those notions, make make those ideas and those challenges and those paradoxes um, tangible. So that's what we call the, the, the post-growth prototype, and I will just present a couple of them. I mean, each prototype starts from one or multiple notions, uh, and it tries to expand it in the phys physical experience. We call it uh, eloquent objects, the, the outputs of those research, in the sense that those are, you know, physical lab experiments, like the one which is at Axioma at the moment, and they create um, sort of situations to, to reflect and think about. Let's start with the first sort of notion that uh, we wanted to, to expand into a project. It's the notion of ancient sunlight, and uh, I will just play the, the clip. For the vast majority of human history, humans lived on current sunlight. Sun fell on the fields, the fields grew plants, the plants made cellulose, plant matter. Animals ate the cellulose, we ate the plants, we ate the animals, we were living off current sunlight. It was our food supply, our clothing. We heated with wood, it was our heat supply, our light supply, it was all current sunlight. The sunlight that fell on earth in a year was the maximum amount we could use. And from the earliest evidence of human civilization, 150,000 more or less years ago, up until a few thousand years ago, pretty much. That's how we lived. And our population never surpassed a billion people. And then we began discovering that there were pockets of ancient sunlight, and finding coal here and a little bit of oil there, and slowly, that and the agricultural revolution, our population crept up until we hit the first one billion people. Our second billion took only 130 years. When Kennedy was inaugurated, there were half as many people as today. The reason that we've been able to have this exponential growth of population is because we're creating food and clothing and everything else, transportation, we're doing it all with this ancient sunlight that was stored in the earth three and four hundred million years ago. Uh, this project is called Energy Slave Tokens. Uh, and basically, uh, it's based on uh, old notions from the 40s, developed by uh, Buckminster Fuller. Uh, basically, at this time, he was trying to find a way to translate the lifestyle of uh, his contemporary um, North American citizens uh, into something tangible. He believed that the lifestyle uh, we had at the time uh, in US was way beyond the capacity of a human body. And indeed, when he started to calculate uh, the relation between what a human body can perform in terms of what, uh, if a human body works like eight hours a day in a factory or cutting wood or whatever, um, and the lifestyle of an um, average American, a North American, he ended up with about 100 energy slaves per uh, citizen. So it means that each citizen at the equivalent um, energetic uh, availability and uh, lifestyle of 100 uh, like workers. Uh, so it means that all this uh, hidden uh, energy comes from um, you know, fossil fuel, coal, and so on. And if you will do the same calculation today uh, in Europe, you would end up rather around four to 500 energy slave per uh, citizen. So it means that basically, you know, like, as I explained, like 30 minutes before, like, it's not anymore about the ability of your own body to perform work and to transform the environment around you. Uh, it's more and more, and we are talking about one to 500. So it's that level of more and more, uh, the ability of this infrastructure to, to change the world. I mean, we are, directly and indirectly uh, triggering those changes. And the choice we make as a society also are having effect on that in the sense that, you know, even if you decide to do everything you can to lower your consumption, you are still a Slovenian citizen or, a, I don't know, Dutch citizen or a Spanish citizen. And just by this fact, 
uh, you have a share also of the highways, of the schools, of the health ins insurance, of uh, whatever constitutes a, a nation, a state, and all the benefits uh, you enjoy from being a citizen of this nation or so on. So that's not only about your individual decision, that's a very complex system that has a sort of a cost in terms of matter, energy, and so on and so on. So the energy slave uh, unit is just a way to sort of grasp a little bit those scales. And the scale between the energy of your own body, so like if you were to work a full day with your body, and the quantity of uh, fossil fuel. So we'll just show a, few, a little clip, and then uh, we'll look at uh, the physical uh, object we developed around this uh, idea. Buckminster Fuller refers to the fuel that powers machines in the concept energy slave, an equivalent measure of human work. The unit, one energy slave, represents the physical labor capacity of one human adult in good health. The energy requirements of any lifestyle can be converted into their equivalent in energy slaves, the number of human laborers who would otherwise be required to generate the same amount of energy consumed in that lifestyle. In 2013, it was estimated that the average European uses the equivalent of 400 to 500 energy slaves working 24 hours a day. Energy slave tokens are human labor to fossil fuel conversion units. They consist of a series of weights made of petroleum. Each token is the volume of petroleum energy equivalent to a duration of human labor. One hour, one day, one week, one month, one year, one life. Translated to human scale, these standard units manifest the multiple orders of magnitude that separate the labor energy potentially exerted by our human bodies from the energy exploited from fossil fuels feeding the technosphere. These tokens render tangible the orders of magnitude we will need to confront in order to address the energy transition imperative. So basically we, we see the those tokens or those weights uh, just as interfaces to get a little bit of a physical sense of those uh, scales in the order of magnitudes, in the sense that we know about fossil fuel, we are using it every day, uh, deliberately or not, but it's quite hard to, to grasp and to get uh, how unique, singular and um, condensed is this uh, type of energy. So we wanted to make it a little bit more like sort of tangible and down to earth. So what you see behind me are those uh, actual weights. Uh, and for instance, one year will be around 30 liter, which is let's say half of your tank in the, in the car, the car tank. And you can see that, you know, one year of very long, uh, consistent human activity. Uh, so let's say, let's take the work standard in Slovenia. So maybe, I don't know, five days a week, uh, seven hours or eight hours a day with your three weeks of, vac of uh, vacations and whatever. So that will be the, uh, the equivalent to 30 liters of uh, oil at the end of the year. So that gives you an idea of the scales we are talking about and the sort of uh, immense quantity of energy that uh, we are depending on. And we also think that that's useful in the sense that when we kind of daydream about transitioning uh, after fossil fuel, so leaving fossil fuel behind, we have to also confront with the scale of what we're talking about. And uh, that's quite a level of change. Uh, that is not just a technical question. Another very um, interesting and um, evocative notion that we think is interesting as a provocation because it's full of sense in the, you know, if you think about uh, ecosystem as something that provides uh, the basic um, wealth and the basic uh, needs uh, for uh, life on Earth, uh, it's quite self-evident and it's uh, something 
that intuitively uh, works quite easy. Uh, but it's also a notion that is used for uh, contradictory purpose. For instance, uh, you can use ecosystem services to start valuing the pollution of a river or valuing how much a company needs to pay in fine because it, uh, you know, like uh, polluted uh, anything or by, because it was responsible for the, the death of uh, animals or whatever. Uh, but this notion in itself has an interesting take on uh, economics in the sense that it reminds us that uh, as human, uh, we are not uh, the source uh, of, uh, or let's say we are not producing uh, all the um, energy and all uh, the basic requirements of our lifestyle. And that um, a, a, a huge part of it uh, is actually the product of, uh, let's say, a well-balanced uh, ecosystem. So we'll just play a, a quick example, um, sample of it, and then show the, the, the sort of project that we developed around it, and that is exhibited at Axioma. Ecosystem services, the idea that we need to move the ecology into the economy. We don't know if a given species of corn that might have been grown somewhere in Peru is gonna be useful 100 years from now, 500 years from now, somewhere else. There is absolutely no way of telling which species are going to be valuable and which are non-valuable over time. That kind of false consciousness prevents us from seeing the world itself as interconnected, inter-knit in one way or another. Ecosystem services have this strange equation and it's largely based on what this ecosystem is doing for me now. But if we get away from this frozen present, infinity starts appearing all over the place. If we take a sufficiently large expanse of time and we pay sufficient attention to the imbrication, the way in which species interact with each other all of the time, the way in which species terraform the earth, you're just gonna run into infinities all of the time. Well, so to explain the project we wanted to develop, we wanted to find the simplest way to show and to experience the fact that um, the way that we are used to understand economics and value is sort of misleading uh, in our current situation, in the sense that we are invited to think about value uh, through the lens of uh, current economics. And, you know, the economics of uh, monetary price of goods and services is not a lens that helps us at all to understand the intrinsic value and uh, all the uh, material and energetic cost that makes a thing uh, being available at a given moment or being you know, like, uh, used by a human being at a given moment. It doesn't translate that at all. It's not made to be translated in, in this way. And what is mainly missing is the fact that we consider that uh, environmental resources are infinite, or at least what we call neoclassical economics, which is the main economic uh, system we are trained to think through, uh, or think with, uh, consider environmental resources or uh, the biosphere as an infinite uh, resource. So it consider that it has no value because it's infinite. And the, the fact that we think through this lens uh, is uh, sort of invisibilizing, obscuring, uh, let's say, the work of the biosphere that makes things uh, available and that makes things grow and that makes things uh, circulate and flow around us. And uh, mm, all this uh, set of relations that uh, makes uh, urban life possible uh, because as urban beings, we are mostly uh, benefiting from things, but hardly uh, producing uh, anything in the hardcore sense. Um, that's what the, the, the essay we, we published uh, tries to demonstrate a little bit. So what we wanted to do is to find a sort of a trick to show not the real cost, not the exact monetary cost, but more the scale of what we don't take into account on a daily basis. So to do that, we just took a square meter of wheat that we are cultivating, not outdoor, but in a black box, fully inside. 
And by doing that, by doing this trick, uh, first of all, you are forced to show very clearly everything that this square meter uh, requires, depends upon. So basically, you know, it requires water, a lot of water, it requires soil, it requires nutrients, it requires wind, uh, it requires artificial sun, and all of this suddenly needs to be provided artificially, right? So by doing that, we can also start this kind of weird accounting uh, strategy where you can, you can say, okay, so everything that usually uh, is uh, sort of a given uh, when you think about an outdoor environment, suddenly you need to uh, show and provide it uh, in an artificial way. And this has a cost and this has a quantity of matter, of water and so on. So that's what we are doing in this experiment. Basically, we are playing the trick of economics uh, to show what will be the sort of approximate cost if we are to reproduce all those services. And in a way, um, it's absurd to think through this lens, but it's also, if you forget about uh, having a precise uh, price, a trustable price, and you look more at the scale, it becomes interesting because you are showing a scale, not an exact accounting uh, strategy. And by looking at this scale, it also gives you an idea of uh, what is damage when we are talking about the damage to climate, the, dam the damage to uh, environmental degradation and so on. So, you know, when we talk about all those things that are changing and that are the major around us, it's hard to even understand the scale and, you know, wh what, what are the order of magnitude we are talking about. So by doing a project like this, it's also a way to give us a glimpse, a little bit of an idea of what scales we are talking about, what are the scales that are obscured. So in this simple example, uh, if you will buy a kilogram of wheat on the market today, on the global market, it will be about 15 cents per kilogram. So that's the average price that uh, is used nowadays. And if you do this kind of absurd experiment, you end up with uh, two to 500 uh, euro per kilogram of wheat, depending on the, you know, like the methods, the techniques, the, the local price of electricity and so on. And we don't really care about this precise number, but it just gives us a, a scale of the more than 1,000 times uh, difference between uh, the price that we consider uh, the wheat to be on a daily basis and the price that it ended up, end up uh, costing when we t change a little bit the, the configuration. <laughs>
This procedure makes palpable the orders of magnitude of material and energy flows that are required to reproduce human nutritional requirements in closed or artificial environments, in contrast to outdoor agriculture on arable land. By attempting to grow a staple food such as wheat, which has historically provided the greatest proportion of necessary caloric intake for humans in Europe, this indoor farm experiment is a counterexample which points to the vastness of the ecosystem contributions involved in conventional agriculture. Empirical true cost estimates obtained through this indoor experiment are about 200 euro per kilogram of wheat, an extravagant cost compared to the 15 cent per kilogram current market price. This experimental farm foregrounds the incalculable ecosystem services demands of conventional agriculture which we expect to access for free. On the other hand, closed environments must artificially reproduce these services at high social, energy and ecosystem costs, which are mostly not accounted for. From a much broader perspective, this art experiment provides a speculative reference for a reckoning of the undervalued and overexploited work of the biosphere. Ecosystem processes provide the primary value at the core of each of our daily economic interactions within society. Okay, so that's the, the project you will discover at Axioma in a slightly different uh, setup. But those are some examples of previous uh, iteration of the experiment. <clears throat> um, and one thing that we started to develop is to actually harvest the result of those experiments uh, and to adjust the estimate based on the actual harvest because it's uh, one thing to do an experiment, but obviously it doesn't always produce one kilogram at the end. Uh, and that's also interesting. Um, so we sort of reevaluate all the time the estimates based on the actual harvest. And sometimes the harvest is almost nothing. It can be like 100 gram or whatever. So we just finished with one project, which is uh, the last prototype we are developing at the moment. And that is sort of a work in progress. It also looks at uh, this idea of uh, uh, the circulation of energy and matter in society as being the, the only universal currency. Uh, so I will show the little concept and explain a little bit what are our intuitions and our uh, work strategy uh, to, to sort of make an experiment around that. Energy is the only universal currency. One of its many forms must be transformed into another in order for stars to shine, planets to rotate, plants to grow, and civilizations to evolve. No matter how complex or affluent, human societies are nothing but subsystems of the biosphere, the Earth's thin veneer of life, which is ultimately run by bacteria, fungi, and green plants. We must now return to energy directly provided by the Sun, rather than that accumulated over millions of years in the Earth. As I often say, there is no economics, there is only conversion of energy. Everything depends on energy. Money is an imperfect medium for measuring energy flows in society. So that's a quote by uh, Vaclav Smil. Uh, and based on this idea and many other intuitions, um, we sort of connected this idea with a much more abstract uh, notion uh, by Howard Odom, which is the notion of emergy with an M. It's a quite uh, stimulating notion, also quite hard to take seriously in terms of very scientific uh, um, um, parameters. But this idea is that basically everything around us could be understood as flow of solar energy. So basically, you can his, his idea is quite extreme, but it, basically that you could account for everything as a derivative of initial solar energy. 
So if you think about plants, it's pretty easy to see that. Uh, you can see plants as a way to capture solar energy in matter. But if you, you can start thinking about wind, and wind is also activated by sun, uh, tides as well. And then you can think about fossil fuel as a sort of uh, temporal accumulation of uh, solar energy in matter. And his uh, idea is that we could account for matter and energy around us uh, through this lens and basically putting everything on the same basis as sort of uh, accumulation of uh, derived solar energy. And that's quite radical and uh, super stimulating um, from a cultural perspective. And we are trying to grasp this, uh, the radicality of uh, this type of approach um, into an art project. So, you know, we can show just the, the early stages of this uh, um, work in progress uh, through another short video and then we will uh, close the, the lecture for tonight. If energy is the only universal currency, Let's imagine a currency based on the primary energy source for life on Earth since ancient times. A million years ago as today, day after day, sunlight irradiates the Earth, where it is stored and transformed in living tissue. Sunlight provides most of the energy we depend on today, whether transformed over short time frames in living biomass, wind, and tides, or concentrated over millions of years into fossil fuels, so-called ancient sunlight. Across the biosphere, regions have differing amounts of vegetation capable of processing solar income. Regions also have differing access to free solar energy. Some places receive more solar income than others, while some consume more than others. This can be interpreted as a continuous transfer of solar wealth, current and fossilized across space, generations, and species. To paraphrase George Box, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Starting in the 1970s, Howard T. Odom developed a speculative environmental accounting model called Emergy, based on solar irradiation. The energy model's main assumption is that sunlight, fuel, electricity, or human work can be accounted for as the amount of solar energy required to reproduce them. Energy is the estimate of solar irradiation directly or indirectly required to generate a flow or store of energy in matter. It proposes a comprehensive account of energy contributions essential to life on Earth and helps identify the renewable part of these flows. Without promising to be the true picture of energy flows, energy provides unique insight into the global chain of energy interrelationships at play in the biosphere. The solar share coins are an experiment in putting the energy model to work. The coins are fossil fuel equivalents to local solar energy income. The ancestral dimension of fossil fuels is contrasted with the more situated and active nature of the biosphere, solar income. Each coin is thus the manifestation of the estimated amount of biosphere work currently fueled by solar irradiation in a given region. For instance, a coin weighing 268 grams corresponds to the solar income on one square meter in the area of Lagos, Nigeria over a year. A 33 gram coin corresponds to one square meter in Brussels, Belgium. And a 12 gram coin corresponds to one square meter in Rovaniemi, Finland. If energy is the only universal currency, the solar share currency model emphasizes the physical dimension of solar-powered biosphere processes of which contemporary political economy is merely a subsystem. 
The solar share coins can be understood as units of biospheric proof of work that have sustained life, including social life, since time immemorial. So, at this moment in time, this project is more like a prototype in a thought experiment that will be expanded and uh, developed in different ways in the future. Uh, right now, it takes this shape where we produce this kind of uh, fossil fuel equivalent of the local solar solar income or the way that the local type of vegetation and biosphere sort of harvest um, or capture uh, solar energy through wind and so on uh, and represent it so like we can see like in, in the energy slave equivalent in fossil fuel that was about human labor here it's about what we could say uh, the biosphere work or biosphere labor translated into fossil fuel equivalent. So that's kind of one year uh, on one square meter average uh, biosphere work translated into this type of uh, fossil fuel coin. Yeah, and that's something that we will um, push forward in different uh, direction in the coming year. Uh, and that has been informed by this type of uh, diagram that we developed as a way to help ourselves think about those ideas and those issues. Yeah, that's a sort of a example of uh, how we work and how we try to um, get closer to an idea through, through diagrams. And I guess uh, I need to thank again uh, Axioma to have us tonight. Um, and thanks, thanks for the, the trust and the support.